hold on because I think we all need to hold on to something. So. No one knows let me come in. Doors all fastened and the windows pinned. Keep your head on the plow. Hold on. No one said you done lost your track. Can't plow straight forward and are looking back. Keep your hand on the plow. Hold on. Help me, Lord. Hold on. Hold on. Keep your hand on the plow. Hold on. Mary had a golden chain. Every link was my Jesus name. Keep your hand on the plow, hold on. Keep a plow and I don't turn tire. Every round goes higher and higher. Keep your hand on the plow, hold on. Hold on. strong people. I know it's tough. Good morning. Welcome again to Bethel, Ontario Online. This is our service for August 30th, 2020, which is the 13th Sunday after Pentecost. And the melody you just heard is a very ancient uh, tune. It is called Yigdal Elohim Chai, the God of Abraham Praise. And we'll be singing it a little bit later. It's actually a 12th century uh, piece of work. So we hope you liked that and that uh, we will be able to sing it all together as our gathering hymn. If you would now please join me in the responsive call to worship. Let us begin. Give thanks to God with all your hearts. We, we will hold nothing back from our God. Sing full-throated praises to our God. We will join in the chorus of thanksgiving for God's abiding love. Glorify God and that word we know as Jesus Christ. We'll worship our God with wonder and joy. And now please join me in this opening prayer. God, you are made known to us in the rustling wind that blows, in the blazing fire that does not consume in the face of the good, in the deep of the unknown. We meet you here. We accept your greeting. 
We welcome your inspiration. We await the change you have in store for us. Draw us into you. Inhabit our spirits. Focus our attention. Bring us to you, you who are already with us. Help us to be as you would have us be. Through Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, here and everywhere, now and always. Amen. And now, our first hymn today is The God of Abraham Praise. If you will please join me in singing. much for singing that with us. It is such a beautiful and ancient text that uh, it's, it's an inspiring song to sing. And now it's time for our official welcome. So welcome. And if you haven't yet done this, if you're watching on Facebook Live, whether you're on the Bethel page or the Pastor Sylvia Mann page, go ahead and hit share. That way your friends will be able to join in too, even if they didn't get our letter telling them how to find us. So we hope that you always hit share each week and you'll have sort of a little watch party going on while you're watching our broadcast and people can enjoy and be enriched by our service. That would be just wonderful. And of course we are online and we will be staying online for a while until we are sure that all the numbers in the area are good and that we can safely return to fellowship together. It will probably be still quite some time. But in the meantime, we are perfecting our internet skills 
and we're having a great time in being with you in this wider world that we have. So please be sure to come each week, and if you missed it in Sunday morning and you're here later in the week, welcome to you too, and uh, share it as well with your friends. So we hope to see you all. We had a great turnout last week, by the way. We had over 300 folks enjoying our worship service throughout the week. So I am just really excited about all of that, and I hope it keeps up. And now, all you 300 folks, a little later you're going to hear me uh, introducing our offering time, and I certainly hope that everybody sends in a little bit to help support the ministries when we get there. Now, I have a special treat for you for special music. As some of you know, I direct the Southland Symphony Orchestra. And in that symphony orchestra, our community orchestra here in Ontario, California, we have a number of really, really wonderful and multi-talented musicians. One of those folks is joining us today, and he's going to share a song with you, and he's going to be singing, and he's going to be playing keyboard, and he's going to be playing his viola. His name is Daryl Sims. So if you would, please give Daryl your attention. Daryl will be bringing us a song called A Heart to Forgive. And it is just a beautiful, beautiful song and a thought. And it spoke to me intensely this week when I came across his performance of the song, dealing with asking that God help us to be forgiving people. That in the face of all of the strife that we face right now, that we still have a heart to forgive, a heart to love. So now please, listen to Daryl. I want a heart that forgives, a heart full of love. One with compassion like yours from above One that overcomes evil with goodness and love Like it never happened, never holding a grudge I want a heart that forgives, that lives and let live One that keeps loving over and over again one that men can't offend Because your word is deep within One that loves without price Like you love Jesus Christ I want a heart that loves everybody Even my enemies Want to love like you Be like you Love like you did want a heart that forgives want a heart that forgives when the ones that are closest that I've known the longest hurt me the most I still want to love them just like you love me even though I'm hurting yeah. I want a heart that forgives When the pain is so deep It's so hard to speak about it to anyone Just like your son I give up my right to hold it against them With hatred inside I want a heart that loves everybody, even my enemies. Want to love like you, be like you, just like you did. Want to walk like you, talk like you, just like you did. Want to be like you, love like you, just like you you did Cause 
the heart that forgives, is the heart that will live. Totally free from the pain of the past, and the heart that lets go, is the heart that will know so much freedom. Lord, I want to let it go. This pain that's inside, I want to let it go. But it hurts so much. Everything from the past, God. Everything Today, Lord, it hurts so much. I said it hurts so much that I want to let it go. Thank you so much, Daryl, for bringing us that wonderful music, and thank you also for when you're able to play with us in our orchestra, you are always a blessing. Now it's time for the children's time, all right? So let's gather all the kids, kids of all ages, let's come on in and be ready for your special time. All right, everybody here? Okay, here we go with our special kids time. Come and see the baptism of Jesus. This is Jesus, hey who's the son of God and the savior of the world. Jesus was born in Bethlehem and grew up in Nazareth, where he grew in wisdom and favor with God and man. Oh, I see. This is John the Baptist. Hey. John loved God with his whole heart. Hey, all you. And he told everyone that the savior of the world was coming soon. Wow. Come on. John baptized people in the Jordan River. And one day, Jesus went to this river to be baptized by John. Hold on. But John tried to talk him out of it. Jesus said, it should be done, for we must carry out all that God requires. Eh, okay. So John baptized Jesus. And as Jesus came out of the water, the heavens opened and John saw the Holy Spirit coming down as a dove and resting on Jesus. A voice from heaven said, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. And John knew, without any doubt, that this was the one they had all been waiting for. This was the chosen one of God who would take away the sin of the world. Thank you so much for paying attention to that special story. And now we're all going to sing together, kids and grown-ups and dogs and cats and cockatiels. We're all going to sing together the Gloria to put our heart in the right frame to be hearing God's word. Let us sing. Glory to the Creator, the Christ, the
listen as Virginia reads to us from the book of Exodus. Our scripture this morning is from Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. And then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. And when the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. And then he said, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. And then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt, and I've heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a, a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me, and I have also seen now the, how the Egyptians oppressed them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and I say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said further, thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, thus you shall say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my title for all generations. Our next reading comes to us from the book of Romans. Romans 12, 9 through 21. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good, Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. 
If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Thank you, Virginia and Sandy. And now our gospel reading. This is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 21 to 28. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what, he is, what has been done. Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming into his kingdom. May we hear and understand what God is teaching us through God's word today. So our road to holy ground. In Exodus today, a bush burst into flame before the fugitive Moses. And the bush speaks, calling Moses to leadership. See, just when we think we have God all figured out, God overturns our expectations once again. It takes an inarticulate, excuse-riddled, stuttering murderer, Moses, and turns him into one of the greatest leaders of the Hebrew people. And then in Romans, we have Paul, who has another life-changing story to rival that of Moses, gives us an upside-down recipe for living in Christ. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Paul speaks of Christian love in action, love that is sincere. And in Matthew, meanwhile, Jesus is reminding us of one of the greatest and most difficult paradoxes of Christianity. To save your life, you must first lose it. He begins to explain this to his disciples, that, that he may, must go to Jerusalem where he has to suffer, and what the cost for following him will be to them. You see, Moses was called, and, and we are called. Paul reminds us that we are called to respond in love, not to answer hate with hate. And Jesus, Jesus calls us to serve. We answer, we say yes. And then, after we've made our declaration, Jesus tests us by letting us know that the road is a difficult one. The journey is about surrender and sacrifice and service. Yet there is joy in the midst of it all. Jesus tells us that finding ourselves begins with losing ourselves. How do we present faith in all its seriousness, but also in its fulfillment and its joy? Well, we find ourselves once again surprised by the limitless and inexplicable nature of God's love, and we rejoice to stand together on holy ground. Exodus 3 is about God. It's really not about rules like, if you see a bush on fire, take off your shoes. No, that's not what it is. The story reveals to us a God who hears, who cares, who calls, and who comes down to save. And not merely pie in the sky after life saving, but real, physical, socioeconomic justice saving. And God calls Moses, who stammers and stutters. Moses, the fugitive, who answers with nothing but here I am, which Isaiah would say later, and which we now sing in that lovely hymn, Here I Am, Lord. Not, here are my credentials, my resume, my degrees, my endorsements, or 
I hope to do things I'm good at for God. Nope. Just, here I am. I am not running. I'm not fleeing from God. Here I am. God seems to want availability more than ability. The ability is provided. Moses had no special training for this. This text is about God, and God is what our lives are to be about. Here we see that God will save, but save for what purpose? So that you will worship me on this mountain. Hmm. We exist to praise, notice, admire, be in awe of, and simply be astounded by God. Now, I'm not talking here about the typical old bearded white man on a marble throne in the clouds. God. I'm talking about Yahweh, about I am. I'm talking about that which cannot be contained or fathomed by the minds of humans. An expansive mind, blown wide apart by such a God, isn't baffled by questions like Moses, how a bush could burn, but not really burn. This text is about God is reiterated when Moses asks with naive innocence, I think, what is your name? God's answer is evasive, teasing Moses and us into some deep mystery, or my choice, the name and hence the divine nature is just too overwhelming for a mere Hebrew word. There are cultures which believe and understand that when we name something as Adam, as human, named the creatures, that we have authority or power over that thing. So is it any wonder that God cannot rightly be contained in one name? Jews rightly omit the pronunciation of the name, which must be something like Yahweh, which, by the way, many seminarians utter with total abandon, gleeful in their thin knowledge of Hebrew, discounting the historic Jewish reverence for the name. What can it mean, even if shrouded in mystery, this he who must not be named? Yes, Harry Potter fans, there is some connection there. I think perhaps the he who must not be named in Harry's adventures thought he could not be overpowered if he could not be named. But Harry had some different ideas, right? Anyway, let's get back to Exodus and see. Yahweh, the word in Hebrew, looks like a verb. I like this a lot. God isn't a static thing, but an action, a movement, a happening. The vowels intimate that this verbal form is causative. God is the one who causes things to happen. So God happens, and God makes things happen. Thirdly, this verb's Y prefix implies a future, an as yet incomplete action. God is the one who above all else will be. What was Jesus' parting promise? I will be with you always. Whatever future we envision, God will be there. It will be about God and for God. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, We walk by faith, not by sight. Hebrews 11:1 1 describes faith as the conviction of things not seen. What is unseen? Not invisible things, no. Future things. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs explores that Moses was afraid to look at God. That's verse 6. If he or any one of us got too close to God and became like God, he could understand history from heaven's perspective. And the price of that is too high. He preferred to fight justice as he saw it, rather than to accept it by seeing its role in the script of eternity. Moses, we should recall, had been a fighter against injustice. When he saw a slave beaten, or two men fighting, or young women being treated roughly by shepherds, he intervened, which is why he was a fugitive in Midian in the first place. Is God now asking him to keep fighting like this? 
or to lead in a way that opens the way for God's redemption, which is large scale and historic, instead of just one at a time. Hmm. And now, looking at how we shall respond to the fight for justice, how we can overcome evil, let's take a look at Paul's letter to the Romans. As usual, Paul has made a list. <laughs> Paul loves lists. After making a general statement, or setting the bar as high as he could, Paul then gets specific. The general statement, which is also specific in its way, is, let love be genuine. Don't fake it, he says. Don't go half-heartedly into this loving thing. Make it real, make it sincere, put your whole self into it. Love genuinely. Got it? Now, says Paul, let's get specific. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. He divides our responsibilities into inside and outside. And this is an inside kind of statement. One of the problems we have being Christian in the world today is a tendency to do inside work outside and do outside work on the inside. Let me explain what I mean. Paul is establishing rules of behavior for the community of faith, for the Romans. This is how we are trying to be. This is who we are trying to be. He describes life within the community in dynamic and powerful ways. He says, we are connected, we are accountable, we are invested in one another's lives. This difficult work of hating evil and holding fast to good is an inside job. This isn't really the call to go and change the world. Although this is our starting point to accomplish that, to be ready to do that work. This is a call to clean our own house. We are called to not let the world creep in around the edges of our thinking. We are called to root it out, to stand against it, to call one another to a higher standard. We are to be in the business of transforming lives. Now, Paul is quick to point out the methodology for this change is always, always love. Our tools are respect and honor and patience and prayer, not judgment and punishment and vengeance. But once again, we put our whole selves into this process. We pour ourselves out for our community, for those within our community who are struggling to learn how to live and love as Christ calls us to love. And we never give up. Here is where that counting thing needs to be remembered. How many times must I forgive my brother when he sins against me? More than you can count, says Jesus. Paul says it like this. Do not lag in zeal, be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord. As an aside, and because several of you seem to enjoy our expl explorations into the original languages of these letters, as this aside, that last phrase, serve the Lord, it could be read another way. You see, translation from the original Greek is kind of a difficult process. Partly because writers didn't use punctuation or spacing when they wrote. Paper was a precious resource. They also used abbreviations. The word in question is KRS. That's the abbreviation, KRS. It has been interpreted here to be kurios, K-U-R-I-O-S, or Lord. But it might also have been kairos. K-A-I-R-O-S, or time. K-R-S was used for both those words as an abbreviation. Paul might have been saying, don't wait, seize the opportunities that arise, serve in time. Either way, serve the Lord or seize the opportunities would fit in this context, so why not take it to mean both? Get to work serving the Lord as we work in the lives of those within the community who need our attention. Do it now. 
But lest we think that our work is all inwardly focused, Paul quickly moves us out. First, we are to pay attention to the threshold. In fact, it might be argued that the real work of the church doesn't take place inside or even outside, but actually on the threshold. The life of the church is found in how the guest is welcomed and included. The spirit of the church is felt by strangers who find themselves in need or simply in proximity to the church and are caught up in the generous, boundless hospitality that draws them in. Now having opened the door, Paul runs out with energy, with enthusiasm, with opportunity. He's dragging us along in his wake. From verse 14 on, we are living in the world around us. Notice there is no crusading spirit for living in the world. There is only service and love and honor and respect. The very same tools we took up on the inside but we use them now with even more tenderness. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Associate with the lowly. And then the whole vengeance being God's providence thing. Here is an instruction, an instruction to have empathy. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. What is behind this idea from Paul is that we are going to get hurt. And Jesus even reminds us of that in the Gospel reading. That's the part we struggle with, right? I'd be willing to do a whole lot more mission stuff if it didn't cost me so much. Or, I'd be willing to share my faith, to trust my neighbor, to sacrifice for those who need if I didn't get taken advantage of or if I didn't get the rug pulled out from under me, if I knew everything was going to work out perfectly to my advantage, or at least cause me no damage. But see, that has never been the promise, has it? Safety was never high on Jesus' list of concerns. Why else would Paul be telling us how to respond if he was simply assuring us that things will never go wrong? No one has ever said this stuff was going to be easy, only that it is worth it. Living in harmony, even with those who don't want to live with harmony, live in harmony with us, is worth the effort it takes. Loving is worth the effort and the rejection we receive. Hope is worth the effort, even when despair seems so much more logical. I know that that's hard right now. It's, it's hard all the time. And finally, we come to the coals. We might wish Paul hadn't said that bit about the burning coals. I mean, it might seem to lead more to malicious glee than it ought. Killing them with kindness is still killing them. But maybe what he was really saying was that the cold pleasure we take in getting revenge is nothing compared to the warm joy of serving or healing or helping. So go ahead, heap some coals, it'll do us all some good. And now we turn to Matthew. And the only thing we can say is that, you know what? Jesus is living out Paul's entire list. And then he carefully invites us to do the same. What love could be more genuine than a love that surrenders all? A love that endures suffering for another. Jesus doesn't make the list because he is the list. And as such, he becomes our model and our hope. No, we can't sacrifice our lives on a cross for the salvation of the world. But we can live each and every day in humble surrender to the need of the other seeking to bring justice to a world that is broken and peace to a world tearing itself apart with divisions and hatred that rise up all around us with frightening regularity. Like Peter, however, we too often wish for an easier faith, a pain-free, risk-free discipleship. God forbid it, Lord, said Peter. Jesus responds to this outburst reminds us that when we seek such a path, 
We are in opposition to the work of Jesus in the world. The Satan in Hebrew means adversary, opposition. Some have even come to call it a prosecuting attorney, those who bring a different case to the court. Is it too much of a stretch to imagine that those who preach an easy grace or a comfortable faith yielding worldly riches are taking the role of Satan in diminishing the power of the supreme genuine act of love that Jesus and through him all followers seek to live out? Get behind me, Satan. Get in my path. Follow my steps. Do as I do. Stop opposing and start following. That is the place of a follower, behind Jesus. Do not lag in zeal, Paul writes. Hold on to the end. Jesus says, There are some standing here who will not taste death before the Son of Man is coming in his kingdom. What does that mean? Is it literal? Is it something the Church of Matthew's time was seeking in the literal sense, like, like so many things in scriptures? Is it a concept communicated in the language and setting of the time? Probably. And some, some have argued that this statement also is in Mark's Gospel and may come from there. And there the statement is actually literally translated as, Some will not die before they see the kingdom. That's easily understood this way, that seeing what Christ has done and is doing in the world is seeing Christ and Christ at work and Christ's kingdom right here and right now. Moses answered the call from the burning bush. Paul on the Damascus road. Peter from the boat. So how are you going to answer your call? How will we answer ours? Let's go. Let's get to our holy ground by answering the call. Let's follow the example of Paul, love in action, and Peter, the rock, and finally Moses. Here I am. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for listening to that sermon and, and those readings for us all about holy ground and living in love and answering hate with love and being charged with Jesus to follow him. And so now I'd like to invite you to sing a little chorus with me. This is called Holy Ground. And this chorus just will help us center and keep those lessons in mind. So if you would please join us in song.
So we now have arrived at the part of our service that is our offering time. It's our time just to remind all of us to support our ministries with our tithes and our offerings. We have many different ministries going on. We have just our regular general operating budget that takes care of things like lights and water and uh, property assessments and things like that. And then we also have the uh, children's offering, but part of which goes to the pet food bank and part of which goes to other mission projects. And there are, of course, the special offerings for the UCC. So we invite you to uh, give to the things that mean the most to you. And just go ahead and make a notation when you send your offering in. As far as how to get your offering to us, since we're not in the building passing a plate around, there are several different ways you can do that. The first way is to just go online to our website. That is BethelUCCOntario.org. There's a yellow donate button there on the right hand side of each page of the site. And you just click there and you can use a credit or a debit card to make your offering that way. If you want to save us a little bit of a processing fee, you can transfer your offering to us directly from your bank account using a transfer app called Zelle. That's Z-E-L-L-E. -L -L -E. Most banks have that incorporated into their transfer section of their online banking. I do know of a couple credit unions that don't, but in any event, most of them do. And uh, what you have to do is identify us as Bethel Congregational Church, and they will ask you our email, and that is info at BethelUCCOntario.org. And then you just fill in the amount you would like to send. And there's also a place to write a little memo if you want it split up between different uh, topics, different offerings. And then, of course, you can always just mail your offering in, uh, support the Postal Service. Our address is Bethel Congregational Church, 536 North Euclid Avenue, Ontario, California, 91762. Now there's one other thing I want to bring up about offerings, and this has nothing to do with money. And we obviously appreciate any financial support you can give us so we can continue our, our ministry to the community. But this other thing has nothing to do with money. And that is that we always love to support each other and hold each other up. And if you have had anything going on in your life that shows how someone has helped you or how you are helping someone or even shows a need. If you have some photos or you want to make a little video or even send us a song, that's great too. All of these things, I always invite you to go ahead and send those things. I, I send that out in our email that if you have something that has happened that makes you really feel connected to God or you have some item in your house, if it's even just a picture of you and your family, that you'd like to share with us since we can't see you in person, please send it in to me. Uh, just email it in or messenger it on Facebook. Uh, you can connect online, use the same email address I just gave you. And uh, then each week when I make the video, I find ways to share certain things with us. Like for instance, this week we got to share Daryl's music, right? Um, and other times I've been able to take photos and make little pre-service music things. So I would love an offering of your joy, an offering of the things that show you God during this tough time. Sylvie has asked us to give some stories of connectivity to each other and to God. So I would like to share a phenomenon that I have particularly loved about COVID-19. The difference between before that time was that people were not quite so interested in sharing and making the personal contact as they shared. And now they are. We have been making exchanges with our chiropractor. I've been sending her some of our lemons when I go see her. And she gives us some of her Texas grapefruit so much that we no longer have room in our refrigerator for all of them, but we love them. Another member of our symphony is now making honey in COVID-19. 
So we just got two beautiful samples, delicious samples of his new product, Canyon Lake Honey. There have been other instances where people have come over and helped us out, done things. We've been able to make an exchange. And it is a thing that I particularly love because we have such bounty in our lives. And to be able to share it and make that personal contact feels like we are doing something that is a service to each other with God acting through us. So I hope that you have some of these things going on in your life too. God bless. So send those in too. We'd love it. And now it is time for our prayer time. We have a, a prayer of confession and the Lord's Prayer, some assurance and some time for silent prayer. So if you would please join me now in our unison prayer of confession. Let us begin. Precious Lord, strip away the mask I wear during the week to get by. Lay my soul bare before you today. Let me see genuine love. Show me the love that hates evil and holds on to what is good. Strip away the mask that holds my emotions in check when I should share your love with someone. Let me see the joy of giving to others. Show me the power of blessing those who persecute me. Strip away the mask that grins and lies and lets the world think otherwise about a child of God. Let us take some moments for silent prayer. An altar, a pew, a seat on a bus, a kitchen table, all become holy places when we confess before God. Today, in this holy place, God meets us, hears us, and forgives us. In this holy place, God empowers us with genuine love to share with a hurting world. Be for God a holy, loving people. And now continue to Call to your mind your joys and concerns as we join together in the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So our last song today is one that I think is a lot of fun. It's called, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. And this is a song that I think I first learned at some camp setting or something, some summer youth group activity or something like that. It's a lot of fun and Sandy's gonna play and I have my special instrument to join her with the tambourine. So I invite all of you to sing and clap and dance around as we sing this lively little song called, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back. Behind me, the cross. 
cross before me. The world behind me. The cross before me. The world behind me. The cross before me. No turning back. No turning back. Let's do the first verse again. Have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Well, I hope you had fun. I had fun. I love to play this tambourine. This tambourine belonged to my dad decades ago. So I keep it just to play for special songs like that. And now it is time for our benediction. And remember after our benediction to please chime in in the comments while Sandy's playing a little bit of music for us to say God bless you, go in peace, all those sorts of things after we do our benediction. And I'll remind you again in a moment. But let's now join together in our responsive benediction. Let us begin. God promised to be with Moses. And we are here to witness to the fulfillment of that promise from generation to generation. The God of Israel is also the God of our community. God calls us from a burning bush. The God of the burning bush is waiting even now to encounter you, call you, challenge you, and change you. We are standing on holy ground. The Spirit calls us to proclaim God's name to all generations. We are standing on holy ground. Jesus calls us from the cross, come and follow me. We are standing on holy ground. Let us go out to be sustained and surprised by the love of God. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. wherever we are is holy ground. Remember wherever we are gathered together, even if it's over the internet waves, that we are together and God is with us and Jesus is with us. And we would love to know that you were with us and where you were when you were with us. And we would love to see you say farewell, go in peace. May you be blessed. Any sort of a little goodbye sort of an internet hug since we can't do that in person. Please know that we care about you and we love you and we are here praying for all of you and we hope that you are praying for us too. May you be blessed. May you go in peace. Amen. <laughs>